Carol Cross died in 2004 at the age of 59. For years, she had suffered from a rare form of early-onset beta-amyloid angiopathy, a disease usually associated with Alzheimer's. Speaking of Cross's condition, neuropathologist Margaret Assiri said, I have never seen a case such as this at this age. I have seen one case in a woman who died aged 81, but the literature shows only a handful of cases worldwide. The sheer rarity of Cross's condition is nearly unbelievable without any additional information, but it becomes slightly clearer when one considers that her brain was found to contain around 20 times the normal levels of aluminum. The source of this contamination is all too familiar for the residents of the small town of Camelford, Cornwall who are still recovering from the mass poisoning of their home over 30 years ago. July 6, 1988. John Stevens, a tanker driver working for ISC Chemicals, steps in at the last minute to deliver 20,000 kilograms of aluminum sulfate to the Lower Moor Water Treatment Works. On arrival, he finds the plant unmanned. As Stevens is unfamiliar with the waterworks, the regular driver, Barry Davy, has given him some simple instructions. Once inside the gate, the aluminum sulfate tank is on the left. Stevens is confused. There are more than a few tanks on the left, and on top of that, the key Davy had given him fits all of them. After 20 minutes of looking around, he takes a guess. Stevens pours 20 metric tons of aluminum sulfate directly into the Camelford water main. As the aluminum sulfate broke down in the pipes under Camelford, it became aluminum and sulfuric acid the second of which stripped a cocktail of chemicals from the piping network and into the water, including lead, zinc, and copper. Susan Jones, on duty at the Southwest Water Authority Communication Center, would later tell an official inquest. I realized something was seriously wrong when I got a call from a woman whose husband had got out of the bath and his hair was sticking together like superglue. Water was sticking to people's skin, curdling milk and tea and appearing absolutely black. These, this was the... Um, These were the water taken at the this time was the we first, discovered it. You know, the sample that we ever took, really. This is when we first became aware of it, you know, which is quite obvious, really. You know, they don't need anybody to tell you really what's wrong with it. But... Within hours, the health effects were apparent all across town. Diarrhea, vomiting, joint pains, stomach aches, hair turning different colors, skin blistering and peeling, livestock and pets dying. It was as if the plague had come to Camelford. One citizen recalls that after drinking multiple glasses of the tainted water, I was sitting in a chair and found I couldn't move. My wife's hair turned red when she washed it and she had a rash up her arms. We had nausea, diarrhea, and mouth ulcers. Another man's toilet produced a gas-like fog upon flushing, which gave him a nosebleed. A pet shop owner's guinea pigs all died within minutes of drinking the water. Unbelievably, the first word from the authorities was that the water was completely safe to drink, possibly with orange juice to mask the taste. In reality, they knew that something was very wrong. The exact cause was first uncovered on July 8th, two days after it had happened, when it was noticed that the level of the aluminum sulfate storage tank was much lower than it should have been. A few days later, John Stevens was called back to confirm where he had poured the chemical. Before he left, he was told to keep quiet about the mistake and that the water authority would sort it out. They did not. In fact, the public would not be officially notified in any capacity until 16 days post-contamination by an ad placed in the sports section of a local newspaper. Even then, the water was still claimed to be safe to use and drink. There would never be any official attempt from the authorities to investigate the effects of the Camelford water incident on public health. In the years after the incident, these clear failures would increasingly be scrutinized and suspicion would turn to a deliberate cover-up. At the time of the incident, 
the water industry was about to be sold to the private sector by the conservative government. This was set to make a lot of powerful people a lot of money, all of whom would have been negatively affected by the incident attracting too much attention. A letter from a water official to the Minister of State for Water and Planning would later be uncovered, describing a possible police investigation as very distracting and stating that any subsequent prosecution would be totally unhelpful to privatization and render the whole of the water industry unattractive to the city. The Southwest Water Authority was later sold for about 300 million pounds, while payouts from the authority to victims of the incident would barely break 500,000. Well, Bridget Pentecost is one of those who drank the contaminated water last July and she's suffered ill health ever since. I asked her earlier on Breakfast Time for her reaction to the Water Authority's offer of a 10% rebate on her water rates. If you've been poisoned, you haven't been tested and you've got no answers and you've got the added um, worry about long-term health problems and you're still covering up going on, what would anybody's reaction to be? What's 10%? What's money? I just want my health. While those in power saw the Camelford water pollution incident as a simple annoyance and roadblock to their political agendas, many residents of Camelford would never be the same. Doreen Scudder, who campaigned for years for a public inquiry into the incident, would later describe the terrifying effects it had on her husband. He became a changed person, very tired and bad-tempered and so forgetful it was unbelievable. He became almost incoherent, and because he couldn't string two words together, he became enraged and would start screaming at me. It was a nightmare time. The man who had been my friend was suddenly a disagreeable person and just so different. Our retirement, our life, everything was wrecked. He was depressed and bitter for the rest of his life. This pattern is all too common among the citizens who had simply been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Doreen Scudder would die in 2000, three years after her husband, but she never gave up the fight, saying, My husband always wanted me to carry on with this to the bitter end, and that is what I intend to do.